Okay, in the meantime, uh, welcome everybody who's joining us for this session. I think we're going to have one hour together and I'm really looking forward to an exciting session. Uh, I'm glad that um, there's quite a number of people who are very excited about um, learning about FRNs in the landscape and territory level. And I look forward to sharing the stories that we're going to be sharing in this session. Um, the outline of this session is that I'll give uh, an overview of what lands, FRNs at landscape and uh, territory is about. And then after that, we'll have the real speakers who are uh, from the three regions of CCRP. Uh, that is Steve Vanek from the Andes, once he joins us. Um, then we'll have Angela from Eastern and Southern Africa. And then we'll have um, Gildas from Western Africa. And uh, hopefully if we manage time well, then we'll have um, a discussion time at the end. But during the discussions, I invite you to post your reactions and your questions in the chat as we continue. And then we'll see how we, we deal with that towards the end. So I'm going to share my screen for now and um, start the presentation. And let me know if you can see it. Just, uh, share screen and go there. Todavía. Can you see it? Still on its way? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sí, sí, sí. Okay. I want to take it at yes. the beginning. Okay, so my presentation is going to be on uh, what landscape and territory approaches mean and why farmer research networks should consider them. And this was set up uh, with the help of Rick. So um, the things we, we, we put together, the presentation uh, about, about this overarching information and um, I hope he's in the room and he can fill in if I've left anything out. So I'll start with the definition of what landscapes and territory mean, because it's a question that keeps recurring. Uh, there's various definitions and what I did for this presentation is just kind of draw out some of the key points that help to describe what those two terms mean. So landscape is a geographic area, which is contiguous, and it consists of uh, farmed and non-farmed land. And uh, there is interaction between the farmed and non-farmed areas, uh, not only in the biophysical sense, but also in the sense that people and stakeholders in those, uh, in, in those divisions work together or, or get some uh, interacting in, in, a, in a certain way. Um, then the territory could also be described as a landscape, but it can also has some kind of special focus in the sense that it's focused much on the human interaction. And that could be in, in, in form of, uh, you know, the law policies or in form of markets or, in you know forms of culture so it's not just looking at the land but it's also looking at the land from the perspective of the people using it and and for what and the leaders of those that those kinds of divisions could be uh, political or administrative leaders or it could be cultural leaders 
and also the, the, the delineations could take those kinds of scales. And I hope it gets clearer when I, I, talk, I talk more through my presentation and when the others share their stories. What we have on the right on this slide is a, a landscape of Mora, um, which is in Eastern Uganda. And we just drew a Google map uh, showing, you know, the farmed and the non-farmed areas and looking at it as uh, there's a road network and all, you know, so, so it's a whole range of things that one could consider, but it's all a chunk of land together and everything in it and working with that, with, with all the contents in that kind of area. So a landscape approach um, recognizes that interactions are key to agri-systems. And these interactions could be biophysical, maybe water, nutrient flows, uh, movement of, of living things, or it could be human. Uh, in, in involving decisions or institutions or norms or cultures. And creating systems change means that we need to create change on all of these, both the biophysical and the human interactions. So we're not just looking at creating change on granular components or practices, but uh, looking at the system as a whole. And what that means also, if we look at it in terms of uh, agroecological frameworks, is that we need to work with multiple agroecological elements in the same area of land. Um, the diagram I have there is a conceptual framework of um, a project in Uganda called Sogam Uganda that was looking at the vision of building in addition to what they ordinarily do, which is produce uh, improved varieties of sorghum uh, to in, in, including other agroecological elements. And they, they, they drew their vision journey on how these elements are interacting, will interact with each other. And uh, what they, they foresee is that if they do that and integrate all the elements, then they'll have transitions to a better, and transition, transitioned to a more agroecological status. So landscape approaches also involve integrating policy and practice for multiple land use. They include collective action, working with diverse uh, stakeholders who have different priorities and trying to negotiate how they work together. They also involve a lot of adaptive learning where you know situations keep changing, they're difficult to predict and um, and, 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 you know, whoever is leading such projects just needs to be ready to, to adjust as needed. So why landscape and why territory scale? One of the main reasons is that if we are going to have sustainable interventions, then we need to understand that agroecological systems are complex and we need to understand those complexities. Embedded in that, uh, there are many interactions that we need, the interactions that we need to see happen are not likely to happen at the smallholder farm scale, especially if we look at the regions where we work. Smallholder farms are on average around two and a half hectares, many of them smaller, which means to get the actual interactions for sustainable agroecology, we need to aggregate multiple farms and also consider the non-farmed land to get the kind of size of land or scale of land for such interactions to happen. And the area and number of people when we are looking at landscapes and territory is not the most important, but what's more important is, is the level at which the, the interactions that we are looking for occur. So if the focus is on water or land degradation, then the delineation could be a watershed, for example, in uh, dry, the drylands project in East Africa. If the focus is on people, then the delineation is community or a political unit. 
And if it's an agroecological business, then we are looking at uh, the area influenced by producers and consumers or, or a network of that. And that, that could maybe also fall within the definition of what a territory scale might look like. What this, uh, when, we are, when we are working with this landscape and territory level, we, we're also dealing with multiple stakeholders and that helps us a lot to be able to uncover any codependencies between social and natural systems. Now, demonstrating agroecology at these levels is very important and uh, it's something that CCRP needs to consider. Uh, because we, we need to show that these, these interactions uh, actually matter and interaction at that scale is what builds sustainable agroecology. So we can have interventions, uh, but if uh, unless they're integrated and properly integrated in a way that that enables that enables these interactions to happen at a scale that that is needed, is something that we need to demonstrate for others to see, to learn from, and to provide evidence that these interactions are happening and that it works. And it's a, currently a major gap in. In, uh, in the work that we do and in the work that many other people do. So the, the examples that we have available on agroecology are mainly from other systems or other areas. They involve farmers that, are, that own very large pieces of land. So in order for them to get an integrated system that is dealing with multiple elements that is uh, that has these interactions happening and, and showing that this is where we started from, maybe from a very degraded state to an, an improved state because they worked on the various uh, components of the farms that they had. All of that seems to have happened on really large farms and, and they were the only uh, sole, you know, they were in control of everything that was happening. And that's a different context from what we have. Uh, we, we live in an area where, you know, there's very small land sizes for our farmers. And these are in mosaics of, um, you know, areas where there is non-farm land, maybe some forest, some grazing land. And we need to bring these different actors together in a contiguous kind of, uh, in a contiguous, contiguous piece of land to, to negotiate, you know, go through a whole process of negotiating how we are going to transform that into something agroecological and getting that to a level where we can then invite others to see and learn from us. And I think that's an important thing that as CCRP we need to, to work towards. Now, would this still be research? Yes it would still be research. We can design demonstration from using a research perspective. And there are different ways of looking at the research happening at that level. We could have the conventional research we've been doing on components and practices. We can also have action research where we try, monitor, observe, adapt, and try again. And we can also design research that is tracking and describing what is actually happening within the system. Trying to move to my next slide and it's not moving. I think it will eventually. Okay. Um, okay, so why FRN level? Um, I think FRNs, the FRNs that we have have already built uh, capital, social capital, which we can build on to be able to to do, to, to build, you know, to, 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 to work at a landscape scale. We've got the political weight already. However, the FRNs would need to change their approach. They would need to include a variety of stakeholders. They would need to be able to review what has made systems and, you know, what, the approaches that have led to systems and uh, landscape change. 
they would need to listen more to farmers to move from uh, their kind of granular component focused research to 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 to, to be informed on, on on what they need to expand to and depending on the, the needs that farmers raise or we might actually need to use our frn approaches to even design or initiate landscape based approaches in new locations where there's motivation to do so so that's the my presentation for now thank you very much now i'm going to proceed to um give a, a quick introduction of the key speakers that the main speakers of this session i hope steve is on the call now um because he should be coming next after me and then there will be angela and followed by gildas so each of these will um, speak for 10 minutes and then we'll have a discussion through chat at the end of this so steve if you're on the call please the floor is yours yeah okay great nice to see everyone um and uh i'll just try sharing my screen now is that right can i do that oh, okay can you maybe unshare your screen great wonderful yeah. wonderful got it yeah that's fine and hopefully i'll have some uh I'll have some luck with uh, the slides advancing. Sometimes there's some challenges <laughs> there. there. OK, um, great. So I hope that now you can see my presentation. Yeah. Yeah, great. OK, good. So this is um, a presentation that I'm undertaking with Raul Canto, who I believe is also here. He works with Yanapai in, the, um, in, in Peru, in the highlands of Peru. And we have been pursuing this project together for a number of years. Um, and I'll just be um, starting, and then I want to really open it up for Raul because he knows a lot more intimately some of the aspects that I'm going to talk about with, with the specific cases. Um, what I want to say, I guess, is, is uh, maybe in contrast to what you were talking about, Sara, that, that Andean farmers and what we've learned uh, about that more, much more deeply even in these last uh, years with the project is that they're really thinking and managing in terms of landscape. Um, so maybe a key difference there or a key factor is that there's a lot of community owned land in within these territories so they really are almost like a, a community landowner which manages a whole territory um, in in many cases not in all cases right there's a lot of diversity within the andean region um, and that the territory is more than just the fields it involves things like drinking water and irrigation systems um, the management of livestock has a lot of uh, lot, landscape components to it. There are these non-cropped areas that are also useful to the community. Um, and uh, importantly, these different elevation zones, which in the Andes are really important for diff producing different crops and even high elevation pasture, which is kind of used as a, as a forage resource. So when we're working as researchers, if we're used to working in, in at the level of plots, we're really playing catch up <laughs> and we're trying to understand that uh, gradually and work with that. And that's where the co-creation of knowledge that is in FRNs really comes in. Um, oh, good, my slides are advancing. Um, so just some examples here. So the crops, if you look at the crop rotation patterns, those are crops that are moving through the landscape. Um, and like even the manure and the organic materials can be gathered by grazing in pastures and then they're moved onto fields, uh, kind of almost using the animals for a lot of that. I just want to put, point out, we, we have a, a graduate student um, blessing, Magonziwa, and I'm sorry I didn't credit her, but it, this is her image from her dissertation, uh, doing some resource mapping on farms in Western Kenya. And you, you get close to this idea of residues and, and materials moving through the landscape because they're moving across the farm. So this is maybe an entry point and maybe just pointing out that just as we discover more and more about the ways that farmers are managing landscape in the Andes, we should think uh, maybe critically about the degree to which farmers in, in Western, Eastern, East Africa are, are thinking at the level of um, you know, that they're that of their community territories and, and how they're managing that. So it's very interesting. I think it's a very interesting uh, question maybe to uncover some of these things. I just wanna also give some examples of how this interacts with the other work we're doing. Um, we have a pro we are working on a project with Yanapai and with another organization, World Neighbors uh, on 
managed fallows for, for grazing, uh, well, both for grazing and for forage, for cut forage. And these fallows, if, because there's no, there's no fencing in these communities to manage grazing. So automatically, these fallows will work a lot better if you really confront the issue of how is grazing being managed and whether the community as a whole has an interest in protecting that fallow, uh, that managed fallow, which may have some nice forage in it from early grazing, let's say, uh, and, and to ensure its success. And if it doesn't, then you may have you know, issues in kind of this, this, this practice, which may work well at a single plot level, will maybe not work very well at, at a whole landscape level. Um, so these aren't single farmer decisions, I think, as you were maybe pointing out, uh, Sarah. And also that these, um, uh, there's other aspects of these communities and maybe communities around the world where this can come in. So things like irrigation systems, shared resources, and also pest management. There's probably some landscape level issues there. Um, just a, a, another quick example of work we did. So this is a, uh, an assessment um, really not really undertaken in an FRN context, although there were some definitely some elements of co-creation with the community, but we did participatory GIS to identify some land uses and then some pretty extensive sampling on these land uses to look at e ecosystem services, especially related to soils. Um, one of the questions we have is how would we retool this to, to do it in a more simple participatory way in, in, in an FRN context? So anyway, it's an open question we're trying to pursue. But so we have these, uh, in, in many ways, quite interesting results, um, new results on the way that these, so we have a number of different land uses here. Each bar is a land use, and I've tried to sort them by putting those labels on them. Um, and just some, some of the different metrics we, we um, were able to, to uncover and then share with the community and, and community organizations. So here we have the level of soil macrofauna as a soil health indicator, and we can see, you know, it's low in the degraded ones. It's quite high in some of the like the mixed wooded uh, one is the highest. And it's also quite high in the high elevation um, um, uh, pasture. Uh, the, an interesting result on the carbon storage on the right is that the, these high elevation pastures, these, these high elevation grasslands are very easily able to match the carbon storage in a lower elevation forest. So when we think about um, carbon mitigation um, and just the soil health aspect as well, those, those are uh, quite important soils and we have this is you know, well known in Peru, it's a policy imperative to try to protect these high elevation carbon stores. Um, and this is, these are some images of sharing these results back with the community and then them, uh, those members of the community, women and men re-engaging with some of the results and, and um, to maybe prioritizing some things that they would like to see incorporated into future planning. And an important thing here is that these communities, they have a very, I would say quite strong organizational structures and planning that, that revolves around um, landscapes, uh, land use rights, things like this. I'm gonna try to finish up quickly because I want Raul to come in on, especially on these last, uh, this last set of slides and share as well. Um, and another aspect that we're exploring and is, is deepening within this project, and I'm sorry for a lot of the text here, uh, all the text, but that there are, there are uh, efforts outside of our project to engage in regional planning at the level of what are called landscape reserves. These are kind of protected areas, but they're not really protected because they're very, very much inhabited by farmers. So the idea is to do some landscape level planning and that this involves uh, some things even like protecting urban water supplies for, for cities that depend on their water from these areas, um, biodiversity, uh, markets, which I think Raul is going to speak to. Uh, and um, I put it here kind of as a maybe more aspirational, but that, that this could be a format for look, thinking about circular residue loops between urban and, and rural areas. That isn't necessarily going on now, but it, it uh, maybe could be. So I just want to, I'll finish there and then I'm gonna open it up, I think for Raul, I don't know how much time we have. Yeah, just go ahead Raul. I think they'll, they'll let us know when we're done. Adelante yeah, Raul. Four minutes. Muchas gracias con todos y todas. Muy buenos días. Buenas tardes con nosotros compañeros y compañeras. Eh, sí, solamente para complementar a lo que mencionó Steven, este, eh, en principio, nosotros como investigadores muchas veces partimos de lo que es este, nuestro interés, ¿no? Entonces, este, 
eh, mucho nos gustaría trabajar todo esto con una visión de agricultores, o sea, la visión integral o la visión holística que tienen ellos. La simplicidad va más de nuestro lado que de los propios agricultores. En ese sentido, sentido estas experiencias, digamos, acá en los Andes, eh, es muy importante e interesante a la vez porque estas distribuciones de las tierras generalmente están hasta a cargo de las comunidades campesinas que son reconocidas para el manejo y uso de esos territorios. Es así que ellos hacen una distribución este, de, del uso del paisaje eh, para algunas instituciones públicas, eh, algunas veces eh, el tener un terreno en descanso o en recuperación es un terreno en abandono y hay muchos conflictos con las empresas mineras, ¿no? que eh, por un lado dicen que eso está en abandono, mientras que para la comunidad es un territorio que está en descanso, en regeneración, y la regeneración no es corta, ¿no? si no es una regeneración que se dan en mediano y largo plazo, hablamos de 5 a 10 años. Entonces, hace, es importante mencionar esto porque la organización comunal hace uso del paisaje y una distribución de cómo usar de acuerdo a sus este, ventajas y desventajas que tienen cada uno de sus espacios. Y al mismo tiempo también hace uso del tiempo, ¿no? El tiempo para mencionar en qué momentos se hace agricultura, en qué momentos se hace ganadería, en qué, en qué momentos se hacen diferentes otras prácticas como son talas, reforestaciones. Y... Esta experiencia de Yanapay parte desde un enfoque de parcela, a, ampliando hacia un enfoque más de paisaje, pero ya no solamente como, como proyecto y comunidad, sino también integrándonos a, a unos planes de manejo, planes maestros que llamamos de un territorio mucho más grande, que son este, reservas, reservas que están este, apoyadas por el gobierno para lo que es la conservación la conservación de la biodiversidad y dentro de ello ya se hacen planificaciones conjuntas, un plan participativo en el cual intervienen comunidades, gobiernos locales, este, instituciones públicas y privadas, organizaciones de base para conjuntamente con ellos elaborar estos planes de maestros en el cual este, se determinan actividades a mediano plazo. Estos planes son renovados cada cinco años en el cual nosotros como proyecto también incluimos nuestras investigaciones en los componentes que nos compete como proyecto. Es así que se hace un trabajo mucho más articulado y también se hace uso de, de, de fondos del, del Estado y de, también de la cooperación. Y creemos que este es un espacio muy importante para lo que es la sostenibilidad de los este, de todos estos procesos de transiciones agroecológicas. Creemos que nosotros como proyectos somos aves de paso, somos este, estamos en un periodo muy corto y, y nuestra intervención es muy este, focal, pero vinculándonos con estos este, esfuerzos ya en manejos de, de reservas o de áreas protegidas, podemos este, hacer que estos esfuerzos sean más fructíferos, en sentido de que también otros actores, otras instituciones, las mismas comunidades puedan este, escalar lo que se ha ido logrando. Es así que nosotros estamos vinculados al plan maestro de la área de conservación regional Guaitapayana, en el cual estamos trabajando con las comunidades desde la parte agrícola, pero también incorporando el proyecto, por ejemplo, el de descansos mejorados, justamente poniendo coberturas en áreas este, donde han sido trabajados con agricultura y tomando en cuenta esos descansos que consideran los agricultores necesarios para la regeneración. Entonces, todas las, las innovaciones tratamos de encajar dentro de, de lo que es el sistema de manejo local que existe. Entonces, es importante lo que mencionaba Steve, que el control social que tenemos, esos clave porque se respetan las normas, los acuerdos que hay internamente y si una innovación se quiere este, escalar, tiene que estar inmerso dentro de esa estructura social que ellos tienen para pensar en una sostenibilidad o la aplicabilidad de, un, de una nueva innovación. Entonces es un proceso muy interesante, pero también que va más allá de lo técnico, ¿no? Implica mucho más de cómo articularnos cómo hacer esta incidencia de lo que estamos trabajando, cómo este, los agricultores también se comprometen y 
deciden enrumbar en esos nuevos este, caminos, porque si no hay decisión local, creo que desde afuera es muy poco lo que se puede hacer. Y es importantísimo trabajar con las organizaciones, yeah, um, de lo que es la sensibilización uh, y la visibilización y valoración uh, de lo que existe como conocimiento local. Raúl, ¿no? Entonces, diciendo creo tiempo. que esa es la base para estas transiciones agroecológicas. Eso es lo que quería, creo que me excedieron en los tiempos, pero es importante mencionarlo. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Raúl. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much. And my, my apologies for, for interrupting. Um, can we move to um, Angela for Eastern Southern Africa region? Thank you so much, the team from Andes. Please uh, feel free to um, put in your questions, comments, uh, reactions in the chat. Go ahead, Angela. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And I am going to talk on the botanical side of the uh, agroecology and uh, how it contributes at the landscape scale. And is it me sharing? Yes. So I'll, I'll speak on three main aspects that we feel are the evidences of botanical use and its success in, in pest management, but also as contributors to landscape-wide actions. And one of the aspects is uh, on station and on-farm pest management approaches, but we have adoption and knowledge dissemination, but also we have botanicals that are being seen as, uh, as useful not only in pest management, but in other uh, farming systems um, improvements. So these are evidences that we have seen from farmers and from our own research on station and also on farmers field that repeated use of botanicals actually on weekly basis as we have been doing are showing us that botanicals can work actually much better than untreated, sometimes would work as better as synthetic pesticides. And therefore this to us is a starting point of wider use of botanicals because then this helps in the pest management, not only in some few localities because botanicals are found actually in diverse places, they are different species with different uh, range of activities that would work in different uh, crops, in different kind of pests and diseases, and that would be used quite widely. So this is one, but speaking about botanicals themselves and regarding the diverse use of it, we have had an opportunity of working with farmers on this. And these pictures here, show how farmers participate in the, in the whole process of adding value and processing botanicals for use. So from good results that we are seeing, we are seeing that there are some strategies for uptake of botanicals. We have, a, a, we have had a good way of collaborating with farmers from propagating actually, harvesting, drying, processing, and, and ultimately applying botanicals. And this is also paving ways for further prospects because having powders gives a, a, a notion that at some point we would pack this and store it, but also sell at some point. So there are a number of uh, actions that are helping us to widen the scopes of using botanicals not only from the fields, but expanding to the landscape. But as you can see, a woman harvesting, this is Tithonia diversifolia that has grown just in the roadway or in the field margin, but has good flowers that would be used as forages for pollinators and natural enemies. But also this can also be used as a green mulch and there's some other soil amendment or soil pest management activities as, as you see shortly. And therefore, just from the picture, we can see that botanicals would be used and it, it, it helps to decorate the landscape. It is also a pesticide, but at the same time helps to, to affirm to farmers that these are things that could be used for the best. 
but also not only presence of the botanicals in their landscapes, but there's a way to improvise and improve ways of using them so that they are useful for pest management, but also in the, in the environment. So the second uh, action that I was speaking about was about knowledge sharing and dissemination. And this is the main point I would wish to communicate here is the fact that it is very true that we are really facing a challenge in the registration and some other regulations along pest management or, or pesticides. And we compete so much with the synthetic pesticides world. And in this case, how much as the botanicals are seen as an alternative, they face a, 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 a certain big challenge. And the only way I think and I believe can help us through is to increase the critical mass of people who are using the technology, who appreciate and who are activists in using it so that we have a wider, wider use and therefore we have people at, at the back as a backup when we, we, we go forward or we go together trying to advocate for say policy reforms and some other regulation flexibilities that would suit sustainable pest management approaches so this gives us we have done a number of these not only to farmers down here in my down left side of the, the picture shows um, farmers trying to share feedbacks and discussing ways forward in using botanicals. But on the other side, we see with the farmers and researchers trying to work together to, to, to mix up botanicals learning do's and don'ts of botanicals, learning local ways of understanding botanicals as well as the scientific ways of, of understanding about botanicals, and hence coming together to, to have common understanding on what we are doing, how best we have to do it. But in the other picture on my top left again, this is somewhat an international intervention. Here I was presenting in the FAO forum and so it is also a way of inviting and involving stakeholders, bigger stakeholders and, and the, the other stakeholders in a way that we have all together, as I said earlier, a critical mass of people, of users, of people who understand about botanicals. And I feel like this may take long to let a lot of people, a huge number of people from different capacities come together and understand and get convinced to have a sustainable pest management. But I think it will result in, in an easy way of penetrating through policy reforms when we have everyone in the same page with diverse but collective actions. So the, 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 the next step, the third point that I was meaning to speak about is botanicals that is not only used for pest management, but also could be used for other, other farming system actions. For example, here, these are Tephrosia vogeli uh, shrubs in the, in the farmlands, and farmers are using this. The, the, our project is in a place where there's a high banana cultivation activity and they are really disturbed by mole rats and one of the re good repellent for mole rats is the flosia vogeli so when they are planted then the bananas are safe but at the same time they are used for pest management but we were like to visit farmers at some point and they told us that in the places where they planted huge amounts of of, of the flosia, at some point the soil was much better and therefore, these are the areas that uh, previously they were being uh, cultivated by with coffee. And there's no coffee anymore now because the soil is not as good, but also the pests are, are, are disturbing and therefore coffee has disappeared with time. So they would wish to reintroduce because they're feeling and they have tested that the flossa would also be used for some borers in coffee but also the soil is good that they can reintroduce coffee, but they're also 
and this shows quite clearly that the force of course being a legume is also good for soil improvement and therefore all these things show that at least botanicals in the landscapes are used for more than one reason and this when understood and taken up quite uh, well and positively is actually a very good contributor to landscape uh, management and um, and so we have our prospects our prospects are that moving forward and also contributing to increasing attention increasing usability and increasing a number of actors in the pest management approach we have uh, now working on soils trying to check on soil borne pests and diseases we have a phd student now who is focusing on that but also our our second year of activities in the project we are trying also to check on soil pest and disease management and the contribution looking now quite closely on the contribution of botanicals for soil pest management and soil improvement so we'll look at green mulch we'll look at uh, 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 above and below ground ecosystems and also the the potentials for botanicals in soil pest management but also of importance is another area of local commercialization i was mentioning earlier that now that farmers can can go and, up to making powders angela are you about to finish yes this is my last Thank you. slide yeah Great. so okay. now that farmers uh, can make powders they can pack and sell some botanicals so we are thinking about local commercialization avenues actually there is a very good uh, opportunity for for selling products and services around pest management that would help farmers but also gain attention and increase well-being. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Angela, uh, for a very good uh, story from Eastern and Southern Africa. Again, I invite um, comments. I can see there's already discussions in the chat. So please have a look there and um, continue the discussions. Gildas, welcome to the floor. Okay, thank you. My name is Gila Sasoba, and I'm a PhD candidate um, at Buckingham University, but it's so So I'm going to present you here some some of the results of our work on participatory analysis of biomass fluxes at landscape scale in semi-arid Burkina Faso. So I'm working um, in a project called Tree F, which stands of feed the soil and feed the cow to feed the people. It is funded by the Mark Knight project. And we are co-designing uh, aggressive pastoral systems in Sudan Australian zone of Burkina Faso which is a region characterized by biomass scarcity as a result of low soil fertility, climate variability, and poverty. So in the tree of project, we are working at three scale. Uh, we are testing uh, some innovations, uh, agroecological innovation at low scale with farmers. We are also doing some biomass monitoring work at farm and landscape scale. So at landscape scale, uh, we are trying to answer mainly two questions. First, how do individual farm management and farm interaction influence biomass fluxes and production at village scale? Second, what are the impact of plot scale agroecological innovation on biomass production at farm and village scale? So we adopted the methodology uh, in three steps. The first step is really about dialysis that we, we did with farmers. It was a participatory mapping of the two villages in which we're working, which are Yilu and Tansin. So we did um, a participatory um, construction of those maps, uh, identification of infrastructure and major land use type in the villages, 
And we also validated these maps with farmers, including um, local authorities. The second step was the evaluation of spatial distribution of shrub and trees biomass. And for that, we implemented an inventory of shrub and trees diversity in, uh, and biomass in Yilu using a regular grid with a one kilometer by one kilometer resolution. And at each node of this grid, we installed a 50 meter by 50 meter plot to investigate both the diversity of sh uh, shrub and trees, but also the, the biomass, the woody biomass that was there. Interestingly, the, a similar work has been also done in the same village in 2014. So what we did is that after having our data, we later compared the data in 2014 with the data that we got in 2020. And uh, additionally, we, we added the, uh, an individual survey to explain the dynamic of, of woody biomass in the village. And finally, um, we use um, remote sensing data, so optical and radar data, as well as machine learning algorithm to estimate spatial distribution of shrubs and tree biomass at village scale based on the inventory data. So the last step of our work is uh, uh, mainly about companion modeling, which is a mixture of serious game and uh, agent-based modeling. So we design, we could design with farmer a serious game based on farming system data that we collected and farmer feedback to simulate farm management and interactions. And this game has been used now and served with, for the development of, a, of an agent-based model to explore biomass fluxes and production at plot, farm, and village scale. The data that we also got from participatory mapping and also the shrub and tree biomass has been included in the development of the model. So for the result, the participatory mapping map that we, we validated with farmers, you can see that this is the, the, the map of the first village it's called Yilu. As infrastructure, as major infrastructure, we can see that there are um, the presence of national roads facilitating trade, and also the presence of river and drilling available for livestock and vegetable growers. And also impor something important was also the important, the, the presence of gold mining as as important source of, of farm income for farmers in the village. Now for the second village, which is uh, much smaller, we have no national roads, so trading is more constrained, no river, and only few drilling and artificial ponds. Now, when it comes to the spatial distribution and the dynamic of uh, woody biomass, we have noticed that from 2014 to 2020, the number of individuals uh, in the plot investigated decreased in 95% uh, of the plots. The same trend has been observed for the woody biomass, especially due to the disappearance of biobab trees in the village. Now, according to farmers, the main cause of temporal dynamic of woody biomass in the village were climate variability, abusive wood harvesting, agricultural expansion, gold mining, and last, habitat expansion. Now, as I said previously, we use a machine learning algorithm to uh, predict the distribution of uh, shrub and trees biomass in the two villages. So the image at your left is for the, the village called Yilu, and the second one is for uh, Tansen, which is a smaller village. And you can see that uh, in Yilu, the spatial distribution of woody biomass is much more important, and the, av the availability too, compared to, to Tansen, which is more constrained and dominated in terms of land, which is constrained and dominated by problem. So the model that we, we have developed in Yilu, we used it to predict the biomass, um, the woody biomass in Tansen, but we also did um, another inventory in, in Tansen, 
just to further validate the result of the model. And we can see that in the major land use of the village, uh, the, the model estimation were close to the observation, uh, except for the woodland where the model tend to underestimate woody biomass. So generally in average, we have more woody biomass in woodland and agricultural area in Yulu compared to Tansen. And logically, uh, we have the highest value of biomass in woodland and the lowest in very soil areas. We also developed a serious game with farmers, as I said, in the methodologies. And uh, in this serious game, we have four players representing the four farm types that we identify with a statistical typology. And uh, each farm, each farmer in the game receives a certain number of assets, so a certain number of land, uh, livestock, and money. And then he's asked to, to manage his farm in a way that he can feed uh, his family, his livestock, and possibly make some money. So in the game, they are also free to interact, to exchange information, strategy, uh, but also biomass. So the game is helping us to better understand uh, farm management strategies and the tournament of collaboration between farmers. But also it helps us to upscale agroecological innovation that we are testing at low scale, from field scale to, to farm and village scale, village because it's a, it is an artificial village in the game. And lastly, it also helped us to co-design with farmer improved production system, considering uh, the diversity of the fa of farm that we have in our study area. Finally, the serious game developed uh, is used combined with the spatial distribution of resources with the data that we collected from the GIS work to develop an agent-based model that we are, we are developing the model right now. So the model will help us to, to measure the impact of farm interactions on uh, production at village scale, but also farm scale. It will also help us to see the impact of the tested um, agroecological innovation at farm and village scale. And the model will also be used as a tool to explore biomass production and fluxes at different scale. And what is interesting is that we are going to match also the results, the quantitative results of the, the model with the result that we got from the serious game, just to be just as a mean of validation to be sure that the model is robust and is really um, is really predicting what is happening in, in, in real life. So those are the information that I wanted to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gildas. And you, are, um, you have saved us a minute. So that's very good. Um, so I can see a lot of chats in the um, I can see a lot of chats here and maybe I'll just call out a few of the questions that have come up and ask the presenters if they're still in the room. I know that Steve needs to run off um, to set up the other session, but I hope the others can be available to ask some of the questions. Um, so I'm just going to pull them out kind of randomly and um, Hopefully we'll get we'll get some answers to them. So I think someone was asking. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, to figure out who. Uh, how do we then get to bring in? You know, if the farmers are already doing having a landscape perspective. I think it was Roberto then how are, how are we going to bring the research in? I mean, this because Steve raised this issue of um, playing catch up with uh, what the, you know, the perspectives that farmers are working from. So um, how do we, how do we then build that research, uh, research approaches to 
to be able to add value to what farmers are already uh, working on or, or considering. Maybe I can um, I can ask that from again the the Andes team and then invite the East and Africa team to to say something about that. So Raul, I Raul, are you still in the room or Steve is still in the room? Raul, do you want to go first? Hello, sí, sí, perdón, este no le tengo problemas acá con no le copié la pregunta, por favor. Podría repetirme. Um, yeah, I think the question was that it seems like from your presentation, you implied that farmers are already uh, operating from a perspective of landscape. And so the question was, how do researchers then catch up with that and, and be able to, to, to add value to, to the perspective that the farmers are already working from? Sí, no, no te copié completo, pero sí, puedo este, comentar que nosotros como investigadores, este, ya lo decía, este, siempre vamos con lo ya planificado, lo específico de interés de la investigación. Entonces, es posible que nosotros seamos mucho más flexibles y podamos ir abriendo también, digamos, nuestra, nuestra visión a ver más allá de lo que es nuestro, nuestro interés. A partir de esto creo que se va consensuando con la gente local de un, este, un trabajo de beneficio mutuo. Me refiero a que, eh, como siempre pongo en ejemplo, es eh, una balanza. La balanza tiene que estar en equilibrio, ¿no? este, tanto para la ciencia como la, para lo local. Creo que a partir de esto el interés este, de ambas partes eh, uh -huh. se incrementa y se gana muchísimo en conocimiento. Esto lo digo desde mi experiencia. Entonces, este, creo que es importante que nosotros también este, podamos este, sufrir esa transformación, ¿no? ese cambio de paradigma para que nosotros como investigadores podamos, este, como en algún momento digo, este, pensar como agricultores. Y esto creo ayuda muchísimo. Y da confianza localmente también. Entonces, esto es por el momento lo que podría eh, compartirles, ¿no? Thank you very much, Raúl. Uh, any comments on that same question from West Africa? Gildas? Gildas, any, co any comments on that very same question if you're still in the room? Okay, maybe not. Gildas is, I don't know, I, I'm not hearing any sound from him. Angela, any, any comments on that? Yeah, my, my, my comment is somewhat similar to what has been recently been said, like, when we say that researchers should at some point think on the farmers, uh, put themselves in the farmer's shoes. But what I would, I would think is what we need to be doing is to clearly set out plans, have a mutual understanding, have mm -hmm. commitment shared apparently, so that when interventions are done, we, we we get each other standpoints in a very comfortable way, in a very committed way. And I think this brings brings more even even confidence among farmers. I'll give an example from my from the from the site that we are working that there has been a somewhat a traditional research sort of uh, way of doing things and and which is, 
putting farmers into a position where they will listen to what farmers say, or what researchers say and things like that. But when there's commitment, there's a clear understanding of what is at hand, clear and mutual agreements of what is to be done. I think this should be a way forward. Great, thank you very much, Angela. Thank you everybody who's been in this session. We've come to the top of the hour. Um, I hope we've all got something to carry, carry away with, you know, carry away from this session. Thank you very much. Uh, see you in the next sessions.